In many motorsports, the difference between winning and losing isn't always out on track, but rather what happens during a pit stop. A good pit stop works like a well-oiled machine, with crew members lifting the car, changing tires, and sometimes refueling in a matter of seconds. Blink and you'll miss it. But for as much movement as there is in a successful pit stop, the crew member's specialized equipment has even more going on inside. In this video, we'll dive into the mechanisms that make wheel guns, jacks, and refueling systems work in a simplified way that anyone should be able to understand and appreciate. So let's get into it. Impact wrenches used in racing are quite a bit different than the ones you can buy at your local hardware store. With a free speed of around 15,000 RPM and more torque than a semi-truck, these things can loosen or tighten a center lock nut in half a second or less. And here's something you might be surprised about. The guns used in F1, IndyCar, NASCAR Cup, and many sports car series are all made by the same Italian company, Paoli. These guns are pneumatic, meaning that they're powered by compressed gas. In most cases, nitrogen is used because it's more resistant to pressure changes with ambient temperature and it nearly eliminates concerns of moisture buildup. Compressed gas enters the gun at anywhere from 200 to almost 400 PSI. And once the trigger is pulled, it meets up with this device, known as a pneumatic vane motor. This center part is called a rotor, and it spins inside a housing. The rotor contains these blue veins, which can move in and out of the slots they ride in. Gas enters one of two inlet ports, depending on which direction the gun is set to spin. Next, it flows through a port inside the rotor, which pushes the vane outwards and into the wall of the motor housing. Then, gas flowing through the motor housing will push up against the vane and start the rotation of the rotor. As the rotor rotates, the vane is pushed back into its slot by the wall of the housing, and the process repeats, with each vane being forced outward when it meets the inlet. Finally, the gas exits through an exhaust port. So now we've got a rotor spinning really fast, but how does that help us remove a wheel nut? Thanks to the torque test channel, I'm able to show you. If you aren't already subscribed to them, please do, as they were kind enough to send over both a diagram and slow motion footage to illustrate the triple hammer impact mechanism found in Paoli guns. It's important to note that neither the diagram or footage you're about to see are from a Paoli brand gun, but the Paolis do use a very similar design. So here are the basic parts of a triple hammer impact mechanism. First, the hammer cage is connected to the spinning rotor of the air motor by a splined shaft on the rotor. The hammer block sits inside the cage and rotates along with the cage. It's kept inside the cage by this spring pushing against it. We also have the anvil, which the wheel socket attaches to the end of, this cam, which is fixed to the anvil, and this pin, which plays a pretty important role we'll get into in just a bit. When only a small amount of torque is needed, the whole assembly spins together freely, like a drill. But as soon as the gun is used to loosen or tighten a nut, we can start to understand why it's called an impact wrench. Rather than the anvil continuously rotating, we end up with a rapid series of impacts where the hammer block hits the anvil once per rotation. But how does that happen? Think about it this way. The anvil is kept from rotating because of the large amount of torque required to spin the nut. The hammer cage and block are rotating from the air motor, but relative to them, the cam is stationary. When the roller on the pin attached to the hammer cage reaches the ramp of the cam, the cam gets forced forwards, which in turn forces the hammer block forwards and into the wing of the anvil. Then the spring forces the hammer block back into the cage and the air motor spins up to do it again. While the basic mechanism is the same for all of the series that use these guns, you shouldn't be surprised that F1 teams can't leave them well enough alone. F1 teams modify the Paoli guns even further to include sensors for monitoring and telemetry, electronic shuttling mechanisms that automatically switch the gun's direction, and status lights to indicate if a wheel is fully tightened. Maybe that last feature would be useful for other series. Speaking of NASCAR, they're one of the only motorsports using hydraulic jacks in competition. 
There are some differences, but the way they work is very similar to the floor jack sitting in your garage. The key concept to understand is how hydraulic pressure can be used to amplify force. Hydraulic fluid inside the jack is not compressible, meaning that a pressure change anywhere in the fluid is the same throughout. When the handle of the jack is pulled up, hydraulic fluid is drawn into small cylinders at the back of the jack from an unpressurized storage reservoir. It stays in the cylinders thanks to a one-way valve trapping it there. When the handle of the jack is pushed down, small pistons in those cylinders push the fluid through a passage into a larger cylinder, pushing on a larger piston attached to a ramp. The fluid can only flow from the smaller cylinders into the larger cylinder because of another one-way valve, and the ram connects to a linkage, which connects to the jack pad. Because we can simplify force into pressure multiplied by area, and we know the fluid pressure changes by the same amount in both the smaller cylinders and the larger one, the force amplification is just a ratio of the two piston areas. For instance, if the larger piston has five times the area of the smaller pistons, Applying a 20 pound force at the smaller pistons would result in 100 pounds of force at the larger piston. Now combine that with the mechanical advantage that comes from a long jack lever, and it becomes possible to lift an entire car. As for dropping the car, when the handle is turned, a release valve is opened inside the jack, which only allows fluid to flow from the large ram cylinder back into the unpressurized storage reservoir. So what's different about a NASCAR jack? Aside from being made of lightweight custom parts, NASCAR jacks take advantage of piston sizing and valving to create enough travel to lift the wheels off the ground with a single handle pump. They also have a high flow release valve along with stiff return springs to get the car back on the ground as fast as possible. Moving back to F1, the jacks look quite complex, but all of the lifting action is purely manual. The cars are light enough that just a long handle is enough to multiply the downwards force exerted by the crew member and lift the car. All of the design complexity is for dropping the car as efficiently as possible. To drop the car, the jack uses a lift tray, which is connected by a latch to the rest of the jack. In more recent years, teams have opted to use hydraulics or pneumatics to smoothly release the latch and minimize any chance of it sticking. Depending on the team, it may not even be the jackman who releases the jack. See this wire connected to the handlebar? This connects the jack to the pit box's traffic light system and allows the light operator to simultaneously trigger the green and drop the car. The jacks still feature release levers or buttons as a backup. And if this is you, you'd better be getting out of the way at the same time. This is why the front jack's lift tray is attached to a horseshoe shaped piece that allows the crew member to swivel the handle left or right and make their escape. As you'd expect, these jacks feature plenty of expensive materials and unique team engineered parts, bringing their development cost up to over $318,000. I think I'd buy a supercar instead. But many racing series don't require the crew to have separate jacks at all. Air jacks are used in IndyCar and almost every kind of sports car racing from prototypes to GT cars. They work by using gas pressure to deploy shafts beneath the car to lift it. For what seems like magic to watch, you might be surprised at how simple they are on the inside. Each jack mounted at the corner of the car can be simplified to a piston and shaft assembly, a cylinder, and a retention spring. The retention spring keeps the shaft inside the cylinder and prevents it from dropping down while on the racetrack. When a crew member inserts a hose and pressurizes the system, the piston is forced down and overcomes the spring, pushing into the ground and providing the lifting force needed. When the pressure is released, the pistons retract under the car's weight and the pressure from the springs, and the car can pull away. These systems rely on an immense amount of pressure to work properly, but are relatively lightweight, making them a good solution for almost any kind of race car. So we've worked through the tools for lifting the car and changing tires, but what about fueling? Well, F1 may not have to worry about that anymore, but plenty of other series do. It all starts with this mechanism, known as a dry brake coupling. Different series use slightly different versions of it, but the basic idea is the same. A dry brake coupling 
relies on the force of connecting a hose or fuel can to the car to move a spring-loaded plunger and open a flow path for the fuel. If you've ever seen how messy and unsafe refueling used to be, it makes sense that this type of coupling is used across nearly all racing series. The most unique fueling experience goes to NASCAR, where dump cans are still used to fill up. Each can holds roughly 12 gallons of fuel, so it takes two of them for a full fuel stop. But in order to get the car full in a matter of seconds, all of the air inside the fuel cell needs to go somewhere. That's why the cans feature a vent tube that allows for air to escape while the fuel flows in. This tube replaced catch can men who used to collect excess fuel from a vent in the rear of the car during a fill up. Other racing series use a fuel hose connected to a fuel storage cell behind the pit wall. The secondary hose serves the same purpose as the vent tube on a NASCAR can, allowing air to evacuate the car's fuel cell. The storage cells are elevated and per most series rules, rely on gravity alone to flow the fuel. For additional safety, some dry brake couplings have levers that must be pulled in order to start the fuel flow. Even with all of the safety measures in place, refueling a running car is still extremely dangerous. And even the best couplings in the world can't prevent a little bit of fuel from spilling out. It's not as much of a concern in NASCAR, where the fuel lands on the ground, but with series like IndyCar, where the fuel can land directly on the side pod right near the heat of the engine, fires aren't out of the question. That's why you'll sometimes see the crew spray a quick splash of water onto the car to dilute the fuel and reduce that risk. So there's a quick crash course on some of the awesome tools behind a pit stop. Hopefully you learned something new that'll help you appreciate the art of a perfect stop that much more. Feel free to comment any interesting facts I might have left out, and thanks for watching.